Well, Kendall, you've had quite the journey to get to the White Sox, especially the last couple of years. How would you describe your journey, what it's taken, the ups and downs to get to this point? Yeah, I I believe personally all of it set up to, to get me to this point, and I wouldn't have traded it, any of it for, I wouldn't have gone back and traded any of it, the good and the bad and the struggles and the, the pains of going through surgery and finding out I had a benign bone tumor and signing with Seattle and then the trade last year and the experience that I gained in the postseason with Houston. I mean, it's been quite a ride the last couple of years and I'm, I'm blessed and privileged to be here. Um, I feel like it's an honor to play and put on this jersey and at the end of the day, I'm healthy and I'm able to play a game that I loved and I've had a passion for my entire life. So all that being said, it's been, uh, it's been quite the journey. Yeah. I'm going to go back to 2018. You're a starter. You're with the A's. You need Tommy John, and they non-tender you. What was that experience like? You were, I think, 27 at the time, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'd had a couple of decent years and a couple of rough patches in there just performance-wise, but um, the surgery was, was the biggest blessing in my life. I have personally, I grew a lot in that season. I became a better father and a husband and a teammate, and uh, when baseball was taken away, I had an anonymous 18 months, and I went to work. I knew I had to put my head down and just go to work to try to get back to the big leagues. And um, personally, I, I'm thankful for that season of life. Uh, it changed me, and hopefully today I'm leaving an impression a lot greater than throwing a baseball inside of a clubhouse because of that season of life. And uh, it was tough, too, at times, never thinking you, you may not pitch again in the big leagues. Um, but it also drove me to become better. It's interesting because people get Tommy John. It's everywhere. And fans forget about you. You, as a, the person going through it, feel a little bit like a ghost, like you're invisible, you don't exist anymore? A little bit. Um, but I was also in um, the Cubs had signed me for a year and uh, on a big league contract and rehab me. And while I was spending time here in Arizona with with the Cubs at their minor league um, facility, I was able to invest in others' lives and they kind of took the, mm. the thought process off of me. And I mean, you got 16, 17 year old kids that just got drafted out of high school or coming from a different country. I just started loving on those guys and investing in them and, and, and their careers and it made time go by so much easier. So yeah, you do feel a little forgotten in those moments, but then when you hop back on the scene, everybody's like, well, it didn't feel long to them, but while you're living in it, it felt like a long time. An eternity, I bet. Yeah. So you sign with the Mariners in oh, for the 2020 season. Yeah. Something's wrong with your back, mm -hmm. and you kind of alluded to it. Yeah. What happened? How did you find out that this was something, not just a muscle pain, it was something much more serious? Right. Well, we're so finely in tune with our bodies. That's what we do for a living. Like, mm -hmm. that's our, <laughs> that's how we make a living. Yeah. And, I knew something wasn't right. It took six months to find out what it was. Actually, in 2019, when I was rehabbing here in Arizona, we found out that it was an osteoid osteoma, which is a benign bone tumor. And it was so close to my spinal cord and my cervical spine that they couldn't do surgery without really risking permanent damage of nerves and, and even worse. So I believe I'm healed from that. I haven't had a, an issue with it in, in over two years. and. But that 2020 season, it was rough starting when I threw a lot of pitches. So I went to the bullpen. I asked, I asked the front office in Seattle, could I transfer into a reliever if they would allow me? And before they put me on the IL for the rest of the season, they they let me try it, and I'm so thankful, and potentially forever indebted to that organization for allowing me to have that opportunity, and then presenting this opportunity and and the opportunities that came about and and. 2021. So was the tumor removed? What was done about it? No, they just know most of the time it is removed, but they know over time that they burn off and stop producing pain. They don't really know a ton about what causes it or how long it takes to um, burn off, but they do know with um, constant um, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that that it will help relieve some of the relieve some of the pain, and it gave me some relief. But now I don't even have to take the medicine to have no pain, so I know um, 
without a shadow of a doubt that I've been healed. So you well, around this time, you go from the starter to reliever, like you said. How are you a better pitcher? Because your numbers have jumped off the page. Certainly last year, you became a whole different pitcher on the mound. Um, I've added some pitches. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned how to throw a breaking ball. Better part of 30 years of my life, I, I searched and tried to throw a breaking <laughs> ball, and I couldn't. And I didn't let that um, deter me from trying, though. And I was always searching. Uh, my dad's always taught me to never become complacent. And he was always asking me, hey, have you figured out a breaking ball yet? And it was kind of discouraging sometimes when, when he would ask. But uh, I kept searching, and I actually, when I was trying to become a reliever, I went down to the taxi squad um, that year and learned from a pitching coach um, that was in AAA at the time, Rob Marcello Jr., who is now with San Diego. And he taught me how to throw a breaking ball after I've asked many coaches. He just happened to be the guy that said something that clicked, and we went. What, what clicked? Um, it was the way I took the ball out of my my glove, um, with a curveball, and with a slider, that got me into a bad position on hand placement. So personally, that was a huge uh, discovery in my career, and it's kind of changed who I am. So you in 2021, you go four and zero, ten saves, a 0 0.82 ERA with the Mariners. I had heard you were a great guy. I had no idea the depths of your effect on your teammates when the Astros acquired you from the Mariners. This got some a lot of publicity. Your Mariners teammates almost had a, they did, had a mutiny in the clubhouse over the trade. What happened and what did that mean to you that your players would be there for you like that? Yeah, it's emotional still talking about it. Those guys meant a lot to me. I know some people might think crying is a sign of weakness, but we all cried that day. And it's just the investment that I've made. And I don't say I. I know who Kendall Graveman is. I'm, I can be not the best person in the world, but I truly took time and invested in people that, at that club, in that clubhouse. And I'll continue to do that here. And I don't know. It was just a strange sequence of events and I still love those guys and you know that's what I want to build here it's special um, and it doesn't happen everywhere so I know this team is close and I hope we continue to grow closer together yeah this is a tight unit yeah. um, that Mariners team bonded after you left yeah. but I mean how difficult was it for you to separate that? Because you guys become a family. Yeah. It's, it becomes, especially when there's a tight club bus, and it's not like you had that in Seattle. That's right. And I mean, obviously, the unique part of that story is I get traded, and we're playing the Astros at home, and I walk 150 yards down the hallway, and I'm in the other clubhouse. You know, a lot of times you have at least a day buffer in there where you're flying to another city. But this was um, a good five minutes that I had to kind of go from the emotions of getting traded from people that I've invested in, not only my teammates, but like clubbies and, and training staff and strength and conditioning staff, the people that a lot of fans may never even know their names. So that to me was was, was strange and unique and um, once again, glad it happened uh, because of the experience I got to have in the postseason. There's a lot of irony here because then you go, <laughs> the Astros face the White Sox in the ALDS. Something tells me that when you were in Chicago for game three and they had the blackout game, because I was wondering this, obviously White Sox players get pumped up for it, but what was it like to be on the opposing team and the atmosphere in the park that night? Yeah, the, the atmosphere, I told people this offseason when we were, people would ask me about the postseason, I said the best atmosphere um, was in Chicago, uh, the blackout game. and. I mean, walking out to the bullpen, you just felt electricity. You felt excitement. Um, I know the fans in Chicago, especially White Sox fans, have been waiting for that moment to be in the stands and, and to cheer on their team for a postseason run. And you felt it um, a lot more than you did at any other stadium in the postseason. The uniqueness of how long that game was and no one leaving. And I just thought, the, the weather was not great that week or the, the weekend that we were there so stuff was getting delayed and pushed back but there were still fans and um, I want to recreate that I want to be on the other side of it um, 
I want to give something the fans at the end of, of a series have something to cheer about. Um, but I think there should be some pride held in White Sox fans that um, you they may not have known how special it was, but playing and being in more environments than most people will ever be in, that was the most special baseball environment I've ever been in to date. Wow. That says a lot. Meanwhile, you guys seem to have a good approach with the White Sox hitters. You held them to a lot of singles. Was that kind of the mentality, the game plan in that series? Yeah, just limiting damage. We knew how powerful this offense is. And, and now stepping into a locker room to see the offense in person, you understand why, because of how physically big a lot of these guys are. Um, and that was something that, that we did a very good job of pitching against um, the White Sox. But I know that experience that this offense created by playing in that series is going to help in the future. And, um, I mean, you have leaders on this team that even playing, being here a couple of days, but playing against them, you can tell who's a leader and you know how this team operates. And we have a handful of guys on here that I already look up to because playing against them, you just realize, you know, how, how they respected the game and how they played the game. And then we're going to follow Tony's lead and, and the rest of the coaching staff and, and, and compete and play one game at a time and, and try to get back to October so we can recreate some of those environments. But I know the offense is going to continue to, to get better. Now, I understand you did have to make an apology after you <laughs> signed with the White Sox. You had to talk to someone, oh, by the name of Jose Abreu. Yeah. So you hit him during the ALDS. Tony goes crazy. Is this a purpose pitch? What's this Kendall Graveman guy doing? So, so what happened? So I walk in the first day I get here. Um, Abreu is not here yet, so I went to Tony and told him sorry, <laughs> apologized to him. I said, I didn't do it on purpose, I promise. And he said, I realize that now. And then Abreu, the next morning, is on the training table getting stretched. I walk in, I turn the quarter, corner, we make eye contact, and the first thing I say is, I'm sorry, <laughs> so before I even say hello. And uh, we just had shared a good laugh, and I think it was a good moment for us. Um, always somebody that I've respected playing against and yeah. obviously didn't mean to but it's just part of the game and um, hopefully that's behind us now. <laughs> I think it is. Why did you choose the White Sox? You've touched on some things about what's impressed you but I'm sure there were other teams that were interested. You had some choices. Why in the end did you choose the White Sox? Um, this team's primed to win. That was one thing that was on top of my list. Um, the second was Rick Hahn and just how he shared that he believed in me and what I could get done. And um, the city, um, my wife and I have always loved Chicago when we visited. There's a handful of things that go into making a decision. It's not just money based um, because the money could have been made elsewhere. Um, but I, I believe that this was the right decision. I'm where I'm supposed to be. I know that to be a fact. I'm excited to get this journey started. And I look forward to seeing, hopefully having a conversation with you in three years and, and reflecting back on, on the past. So that's, uh, that's my goal. I told Rick my goal is to help win and win a championship here in Chicago. And, and that's what I train for in the offseason. And that's what I'll continue to do by investing in my own career and also others. I'm looking forward to that conversation and what's going to hopefully transpire for you and the White Sox over the next three years. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.